Good evening. Welcome to the Jewel Collins Smith Museum of Fine Art at Auburn University. I'm Rila Brahman, a senior majoring in art and a member of the student team here at the Jewel. And I'm Ashlyn Adair, a senior majoring in industrial design, and I'm also a member of the student team here at the Jewel. Tonight, it is our distinct pleasure to welcome you to The Smell of Risk, a conversation between Emily Friedman, Sean Chu, and Manon Ballet. This event is being live streamed on Facebook and YouTube, and we want to thank you so much for joining us, whether, if, whether it's from the comfort of home or in person. Before we begin, we would like to first acknowledge the history and stewardship of the original homelands and territory of the Creek Indigenous Peoples, on which Auburn University is currently sited. Descended from the mound builders of the Mississippi River Valley, they lived here, raising families, farming, growing a variety of crops until forcibly removed during the Trail of Tears. A clan of these people, the Porch Band, remained to the south of us, and no doubt their enduring relationship with this place continues. We call forth the Creek because it is important for us to always seek to understand our place in the world within that longstanding history. We also extend our deepest appreciation to our organizing partners and the entire museum staff for the important work surrounding this program. We are also grateful to our museum donors for their investments to present these and other programs. And our unit leadership, Interton Provost, Dr. Vinny Nathan, and the Office of the Provost. This evening, we investigate histories of smell and the way that artists and scholars engage with smell studies. This conversation is inspired by the exhibition by artist Manon Belay, A Swallow Does Not Make a Summer part of the Radical Naturalism series at the museum, which invites contemporary artists to respond to the work by John James Audubon in the museum collection. Currently based in New Orleans, Manon Belay is a French artist with an MFA from the University of the Arts in Switzerland. She has been an artist in residence at the Joan Mitchell Center and was a recipient of the Monroe Fellowship from Tulane University's New Orleans Center for the Gulf South. Her exhibition at the Jewel presents work in diverse media including scents, cyanotype prints, and video. Complementing her amazing work are specimens from the Auburn Natural History Museum, as well as pieces by John James Audubon and Warrington Colescott, which feature various nature and wildlife. Alongside Belay's objects, they ask questions about climate change, coastal erosion, and global warming. Some of Manon Belay's most notable pieces are her curated scents, which she has been extracting from the Mississippi Delta region since 2017. While these scents are universal, they bring a different meaning to each person. Scent is a powerful tool that Belay uses that unifies everyone through shared experiences. Alongside Manon Belay's work, we are thrilled this evening to have with us the scholar Sean Shu, professor of English at the University of California, Davis. Professor Shu is a leading thinker of histories of smell and space. He is the author of several books including his most recent book, The Smell of Risk, Atmospheric Disparities and the Olfactory Arts, which considers olfactory aesthetics as a mode of engaging with environmental injustice in literature, art, memoir, and law. His teaching and research looks at the geographies of risk, transnational American literature, medical humanities, the aesthetics of atmosphere, the aesthetics of chemo sensation, and race and realism. We are also delighted to welcome Professor Emily Friedman, Associate Professor of English at Auburn University. 
Professor Friedman is a scholar of the 18th century. She is particularly interested in recovering the lived experiences of readers and writers, from the way they understood scent to the notebooks they used, to the effects of changing market pressures and technology of the experience on literature exchange. Among her many publications is her book, pertinent for this evening, Reading Smell in the 18th Century Novel. Please join us in welcoming Emily Friedman. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I'm a time traveler, y'all, tonight. Um, I last thought about smell in an intensive way in about 2016, and the world was very different then. In my remarks today that kind of set the scene for the conversation that will arise, I wanna talk about what's happened since then in the study of scent and the sensory, both in our own country and beyond. So we'll see if my clicker is working. Oh, I jumped too far. So I want to start with this provocation by the historian Mark Jenner that I think helps set the tone. To think not only about sense that we perceive as part of the olfactory world and sensorium we live in, but also our, um, as uh, Dr. Sue is going to talk about, the ways in which deodorizing also, our rejection of scent, our willingness to not perceive in different kinds of ways. And in fact, this is research that has happened at Auburn for many years and not just my own. Dr. Carrie Castile is a graduate of Auburn History's department who is at work on the book out of her dissertation, The Odor of Things, Deodorant, Gender, and olfaction in the United States. We've been thinking about smells and anti-smells around here for a while, so I'm so very excited that we've come to this moment to talk about it with all of you. We can also think about the smell of risk and my own book in conversation with so many other books in sensory studies. This is just a snapshot of books explicitly exploring smell from historical treatments of different periods recovering the smells of the medieval period, the 18th century, the 19th century, as well as the smell of the triangle trade and uh, Atlantic chattel slavery, to scientific and philosophical understandings of smell. We are in a moment where we are paying more attention than we have in quite some time to this, se this sense that is often understood or talked about as mysterious or hard to describe or disconnected from Western language. We are also part of a larger conversation that you can explore that is reaching out to different communities of practice from perfumers and other sensory artists like Manon Ballet to uh, thinkers and philosophers and scholars to just the many, many, cannot stress enough, many smell enthusiasts that are everywhere we travel to. I want to highlight three particular initiatives here. LA's Institute for Art and Olfaction, which is a nonprofit focused on lowering the barriers to those who wish to work with scent in an artistic and sometimes commercial way. Um, all of these are very easily Googleable. Uh, incidentally, I haven't included the uh, websites because they are very easy to find. Odoropa is a collective based in Europe founded by Will Tullet that is a historical collective that is uh, trying to bring together those of us who are working on smell and allied sensory studies so that we know that we are not alone. Finally, the Umbrella Organization or Umbrella Collective one of the places that you can find bibliographies, syllabi, other resources for the study or just the general appreciation of sensory studies is indeed sensorystudies.org, um, which includes a whole bunch of stuff avail available for your delectation. 
we are at a fascinating moment for the study of smell, in particular because of the moment we are in here in the United States. And so I want to end with two slides that are a little bit of a provocation. One is this, tweeted by the scholar Martha Lincoln. These are two signs that were um, posted this month at the American Anthropological Association. And they show two very different relationships to the atmosphere and the air around us. One, as you will recognize, is a COVID-19 health and safety protocol that uh, focuses on a mask optional policy, but that emphasizes other ways of protecting that have nothing to do with the air. Instead, uh, distancing and scrubbing of surfaces. On the other hand, another perceptible airborne threat, perfume and scented objects, is outright banned as it has been for several years. This is also the case for the Modern Languages Association, the comparable uh, scholarly collective for English languages and other literature and literatures outside of English. And I find this really interesting for us to kind of take with us into our conversation as we think about the air we breathe, the space around us, and how both what we perceive, what we ignore, what we do not know, all inform our understanding of risk assessment. Finally, I'd like to end with us considering for a moment just a few things um, that you should kind of keep in mind for your own perception. And these questions are based on a sense, so to speak, that smell is uniquely personal, historically contingent, culturally specified. We can all perceive the same uh, chemical combinations, but interpret them in many different ways. And we come with different smell vocabularies to our conversation tonight. So I want us to consider for a moment what smells you noticed today in your world. And to look back, what sense do you associate with home, with safety? I'd like you to think for a minute about what sense you think of as dangerous, hazardous, unhelpful. And finally, most broadly, I'd like you to think about what kinds of words you use to describe smell. I suspect you'll find that many of them are metonymies. Something smells like something else. These are questions that only you can answer for you, but I hope that you keep them in mind as we listen to our two honored guests tonight as they share with us their perspectives on this sense. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Thank you all for being here. Um, just before beginning, I'd like to quickly um, acknowledge and thank Chris Malinsky and Randy Evans and everyone else who has worked on creating this wonderful evening and uh, bringing us here. Um, and also to Emily and Manon, my co-panelists, um, both of whose work I very much admire and I'm excited about our conversation later on. All right, so the man who pulls his perfumed handkerchief from his pocket treats all around to it, whether they like it or not, and compels them if they want to breathe at all to be parties to the enjoyment. This line from Immanuel Kant's Critique of Judgment, really influential text in um, Western aesthetics, I think really captures some of the reasons why, the central reasons why smell has been sidelined in the history of Western aesthetics and just kind of thinking about art and everyday perception. Um, namely, that it violated the Kantian enlightenment values of autonomy and disinterestedness. Um, so in my book, The Smell of Risk, I argue that some of the key characteristics of smell um, listed here actually make smell really interesting for thinking about postmodern aesthetics and especially about um, environmental issues, right? The ways that humans relate to the environment. 
So smell is immersive, embodied, I'm gonna take this off. Ephemeral, involuntary, it's steeply tied to affect and emotion, subjective and culturally variable, difficult to describe in words in some languages at least, um, biochemical, not quite conscious, and transcorporeal, a term that I'll come back to later. Um, Emily has given us a great account of the field of interdisciplinary small studies, so I'm gonna move on. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit too about the context in which olfactory art emerges before turning um, to olfactory art, and that is um, we're in kind of like the sort of aftermath of, or not aftermath, the ongoing kind of like process of histories of deodorization, right? Which began late 18th century, really intensified in the 19th century, and which are really epitomized by the white cube space of the modern art gallery, which is not supposed to smell and is supposed to make us feel like disembodied viewing subjects, right? That can kind of just relate to something that's outside of us. So, um, deodorization, I think of in two ways. Um, one, the removal of most smells from some public spaces through things like nuisance laws, deodorization campaigns, and climate control technologies. Secondly, discrediting the sense of smell as a rich and diverse mode of experience and knowledge. So olfactory art is something that I got interested in because it of course undoes um, some of the effects of deodorization, right? Um, so Larry Shiner um, defines olfactory art for us in his excellent book um, as follows. Works of olfactory or scent art involve an intention to use actual odors in a distinctive making way that typically gives the resulting artwork its effect in a recognized visual art setting. Um, so in what follows, I want to explore three affordances of olfactory art, and by affordances, I just mean what olfactory art helps us to think about, communicate, or work through. First, um, embodied environmental knowledge. I think it's especially um, helpful for communicating certain aspects of that. Secondly, representing olfactory modes of racism and colonialism. And thirdly, materially redre redressing olfactory racism and colonialism. So the first of these topics um, is, I'm gonna focus actually on environmental risk here, and it's because environmental risk is very difficult to communicate or represent adequately. So the um, literary critic Rob Nixon has influential descri influentially described environmental violence as slow violence, right? Because it happens um, in a way that's dispersed across time and space. It's in many ways the opposite of the kind of spectacular violence that gets sensationalized in the media cycle. Um, smell, I think, because it has this kind of visceral response in our bodies, can represent or even directly present environmental risk in ways that provoke really strong responses from us, right? Um, so, advanced slide, different angle. <laughs> okay, there we go. Okay, so back to that term, transcorporeality. Um, this is the materialist feminist philosopher Stacey Alimo's term. For the material interconnections of human corporeality with the more than human world, right? So broadly framing environmental relations, not as nature out there, but as nature that co we're constantly taking into our bodies, exhaling and emitting back out of our bodies into the world. So smell, I think, is interesting in part because it's a sense that's inherently transcorporeal, but unlike taste, is also diffused across space. Um, one work of art that I think illustrates how smell can engage with these issues is Boris Rowe's The Swimming Pool. Um, and it's, it's a kind of re rendering of the myth of Narcissus, right? And that it's a beautiful, luminous pool in the middle of the gallery that invites us to gaze into it. But Rowe says, um, an invisible presence, just a smell at first reassuring, but it quickly brings on a headache, right? So he's referring here to the fact that it's actually, it consists of Supline brand fabric softener, right? So a scented fabric softener. And his idea is that like, you know, this fabric softener might look beautiful. It might help your clothes look and feel beautiful, but it actually gets into your body and does things, you know, that could 
um, cause problems down the road, right? So getting back to this question of the uncertainty of um, toxic exposures. Another work I just want to mention is um, Sean Raspit's Microencapsulated Surface Coating, a title that I, I really love. Um, and this is from his residuals exhibition in which he took the um, chemical signature of the air of the Jessica Silverman gallery where he was exhibiting and had it analyzed. And then the molecular composition was multiplied many thousand fold, it says here, and then turned into a scratch and sniff emulsion, which he sprayed onto the walls of the gallery so that visitors could then scratch and sniff and be able to smell the residual smells of the gallery, right, which have to do with often cleaning smells and um, construction materials. So the smells of like maintenance labor and construction labor, right, which we generally kind of repress or don't think about when we're looking at art in museums um, are exactly what's foregrounded by this work. And of course those involve toxic exposures for those workers, especially. So secondly, representing olfactory modes of colonialism and racism. Um, sorry, this is um, a work called Aromerica Parfumeur by um, Beatrice Glow, who's a Taiwanese American artist um, and who exhibited this in a perfume gal sorry, in a gallery in a shopping mall in Santiago, Chile. And she created it in a way that mimics a perfume gallery, right? So the idea was to get visitors at the mall to just kind of come in, think they're in a perfume boutique, and then learn about the kind of like colonial histories of scent, fragrance, and flavor products. So she presented these beautiful perfume boxes on, or perfume bottles on light boxes alongside bell jars, um, Les Cloches, a word that I learned this morning, um, that you could lift and smell these scents that she had created. But um, behind these were informational posters, right? Um, and those posters, um, presented visitors with the colonial and racial histories behind the kind, kind of like extraction regimes that made these fragrances available. Um, so she really kind of frames colonial, the history of colonialism, racial colonialism as a history really like instigated by, in part, by bioprospecting, right? So for example, the poster accompanying El Picante, a fragrance that featured nutmeg and clove, notes that, quote, nutmegs only grew in the Maluku Islands until the Portuguese broke the monopoly of the Arabs and the Chinese, and then recounts that nutmeg motivated the Netherlands to trade the island of Manhattan with England in exchange for the Indonesian island of Roon in a transaction that presumed the dispossession of the Lenape and Bandanese people. Um, olfactory racism, this kind of, I think, really speaks to Emily's um, provocation to think about what smells like home. Um, Annika Yi, um, an artist I'll talk about in a minute, says, growing up in a Korean American household, I was immersed in pungent kitchen aromas. The smell of fermenting kimchi and doenjang seemed to sink into our furniture, clothing, and hair. I often felt ashamed of my family's olfactory world. I wanted to, to smell American, which I imagined would involve becoming perfectly odorless. But shame works in mysterious ways. The strongest odors disgusted, but also excited me. So, um, Sorry, I'm gonna go back for a second. Um, her 2017 Hugo Boss Prize installation at the New York Guggenheim, this is Annika Yee's, um, was called Life is Cheap. And it um, started off with this. So it, it looks kind of like a detainment facility or something like this. But then there are these three canisters that gas visitors, right? And what they gassed visitors with was a scent that consisted of um, smells that were sourced from bacteria that she sampled from Manhattan's Chinatown and Koreatown neighborhoods, um, as well as from carpenter ants that figure elsewhere in the exhibition. Um, so she kind of created this hybrid scent that basically like exposed people to the influence of the smell, like the transcorporeal influence that goes into their body. And she, she says it's like a drug, right? So she thinks of it as a drug that would kind of transform your mind, your mood, your mode of perception before you enter the space to encounter the rest of her work. Um, one of the next works uh, is pictured here. It's called Force Majeure. 
Um, and here you see um, kind of like agar tiles with um, bacterial cultures on them that are those same bacteria that you've just sampled in your body, right? Um, and again, this is kind of a beautiful presentation that I think um, disrupts the idea that, you know, Asian bacteria are somehow, you know, invasive and um, just something that one should fear and be terrified by, right? Um, so I, I coined this term Atma Orientalism in my book um, to speak to this like long history of stigmatizing Asian smells um, that of course we've seen a lot during the COVID pandemic as well. Um, so force majeure, it also I think speaks to the, the idea of like the human as like not just individual, but a kind of always already a collective, right? Of like bacteria that are inside us influencing our behavior um, microbes and all of this. Um, so the term force majeure is a legal term for something like an act of God, right? Something that would cancel out a contract because it's a greater force. And by naming bacteria and the inhalation of bacteria this way, I think she's asking us to rethink concepts of say legal personhood and agency. Um, again, advanced slide, sorry. Um, Okay, so next topic on smell and the redressing of racial violence, really. So just to kind of set this up, and I could go on much longer about this, but environmental justice scholars and activists have long noted that capitalism exposes Black, Indigenous, and other racialized communities to disproportionate environmental risks. Um, but I think it's also really important to attend not only to those risks, which were kind of the focus of a lot of my book, but also to the ways that communities, activists, and artists have worked to kind of redress those risks, right? So how do you enable life or support life and thriving amid these really toxic atmospheres? So one example is the work of the pot citizen Potawatomi um, plant scientist and writer, Robin Wall Kimmerer um, in Braiding Sweetgrass. So, she writes elsewhere in the book about reseeding sweetgrass on Mohawk, like a Mohawk collective um, land where it had been basically decimated. So trying to kind of recreate these indigenous smellscapes, right? That colonialism had depleted. Um, but at the beginning of the book, she writes, hold the bundle up to your nose, find the fragrance of honeyed vanilla over the scent of river water and black earth. And you understand its scientific name, Hiro Chloe Odorata meaning the fragrant holy grass. In our language, it's called wingashk, the sweet smelling hair of Mother Earth. Breathe it in and you start to remember things you didn't know you'd forgotten. So for her, reseeding sweetgrass isn't just about making available a culturally kind of important plant, but it's about the kinds of knowledge associated with it, right? So cosmological knowledge here, the sweet smelling hair of Mother Earth, right? The story of creation um, that ha has a lot to do with like conceptions of kinship, like between humans and non-humans in a specific place um, and relations of re reciprocity with the environment then. Um, it's also about kind of being able to reaccess smell of sweetgrass, the smell of sweetgrass as kind of like an interspecies mode of, of communication, right? That sweetgrass, sweetgrass grew, um, she suggests in, in a way that it could kind of solicit humans to harvest it in a certain way so that it could actually grow back stronger. So there's a symbiotic relationship there. Um, and then finally, remember things you didn't know you'd forgotten refers, I think, to the powerful relations between smell and memory, right? Um, which of course um, also reminds us that this capacity for different memories tied to olfaction is really differentially distributed across cultures and spaces, right? So for indigenous people, diasporic people, our access to these kind of spatially and atmospherically distributed memories um, is, really, is really limited often. Um, and she's also referring, of course, to knowledge of sweetgrass that was cut off by the boarding schools. So there's a lot in that quote, in other words. I'm gonna skip a few slides and uh, just get to my last example. This is from um, the perfumer and novelist, um, Bangladeshi American perfumer and novelist, Tana Is. Um, and it is uh, an image of the Mala podcast and perfume project. So if you're interested, you can find this, the whole project online. 
Um, they interviewed about, I think, five or six different um, black and brown women who had been formerly incarcerated. Um, and, and the interviews kind of explored a lot of aspects of their lives that so kind of circled around their olfactory experiences before incarceration and during incarceration and really got at the ways in which um, carceral spaces were either deodorized, right, or like did not generally smell good. So um, some of the subjects talk about how like pine saw was a smell that became really important to them because it's the only kind of like interesting olfactory experience where they could exercise some form of agency. Um, so they, Tana East then, um, made perfumes that were for each of these individual women, right? Um, based on their olfactory memories and values. Um, so just to give you a sense of like some of what's going on in these interviews, um, one of their subjects um, says uh, about, oh, right, so she's, she says, do you want to know what it smells like, smelled like the day I left prison? freedom. I smelt the air. I felt seawater. I smelled all the things that were happy for me when I was a child. The crystalness of the sun and the water. I smelled curry. I smelled, you know, like I was out the door. So here, perfume isn't an escape from reality or prestige commodity. Um, Tanais's perfumes here reintegrate black and brown women's memories and heritage that have been cut off um, and eroded by the prison's interruptions of time, place, community, and sensory experience. Okay, so quick conclusions. Three, or two things I covered and one question. Um, first, olfactory art um, offers a critical perspective on the uneven risks associated with deodorization and with air pollution and on various forms of olfactory racism. And then secondly, I wanna emphasize olfactory practices of intimacy and anti-racist care through the creation of what Christina Sharp calls microclimates supportive of Black, Indigenous, and people of color lives. Um, and then finally, I'd, I'd just end with a question, how can we connect olfactory work in the spaces of the art world with these broader practices of kind of like everyday olfactory aesthetics that intervene in everyday olfactory experiences. And I think that, that that's actually hopefully a pretty good transition to Manon's works. I think that she gives us a great example of how that can be bridged. Um, thanks. So thank you for being here tonight. I would like to thank the Jules Collins Smith Museum of Fine Art and especially Chris Starring Molinsky for coordinating and organizing these events, Emily Friedman for moderating it, and Shan Xu for your inspiring presentation and for agreeing to be part of it and share with me and with all, all of you our question and concern about olfaction as vital tools for sensing and staging environmental risk and inequality. And also, of course, a special thanks to Aaron Levy Garvey for inviting me to present my work as part of this exhibition series, Radical Naturalist, and the Interior Museum team for the coordination. Thank you. The first slide of my presentation showed the quote from Elise Reclus, French geographer, writer, and anarchist. Humanity is nature becoming self-conscientious. Extract from the book, The Hearse of an Isabitan from 1880. Where Reclus believed that solution to ecological crises must involve restoring balance. Even if this point of view is more as a century ago, it seems to me just as powerful and still guide me in my work and research until today. My presentation today focuses on the olfactory research and work present in the exhibition. To put them in better context, I will also share with, with you a selection of other work present in the show as well as various reflections on environmental issues. I recently spent two months in Switzerland for research residency and an exhibition project. A large part of my research focused on smell and territory in a specific region in the Swiss Alp in Valais. As part of the program, I gave workshops to young children around smell. To begin, I asked each children to share with the group what was their favorite and less favorite smell. One little girl told me, 
My favorite smell is the smell of the wall in my house. I decided to take this testimony to begin the presentation of my work around the world of smell. Surprised by her answer, but especially filled with a very beautiful idea, I started to think of what it said about territory, memory, attachment, security, identity, culture, and the intimate relation with a place. With her answer, these five years old girls put toward all the power and importance of smell in our daily life and remind us that olfaction is one of the most direct and archaic sense that do not obey one's will, but is directly linked to emotion and evoked memories and association that seems very far from radical logic. It is a sense that appeals to our imagination. Through this, this selection, I realized sorry, through this reflection, I realized that the beginning of my research on smell and the introduction of olfaction in my work started so shortly after I moved in 2016 from Switzerland to New Orleans. This radical change of territory, geography and culture, and the loss of reference point pushed me in a very instinctive way to, to search for personal but also universal answer to my operating but the reporting in general. I started my research in late 2018 and early 2019 during my six weeks residency at Studio in the Wood, a residency program located in the nexus of city of New Orleans, a larger 5,000 acre bot bottomland art artwood forest. I'm sharing here <clears throat> with you an image of me extracting the water in this residency forest, as well as the jar of the extraction. Therefore, I focus on the smell and olfactory memories of places in and around New Orleans by extracting smell from strategically selectioned historic area affected by coastal erosion, natural flora and fauna, water and soil extraction, as well as smell from the interior of home and sentimental object owned by the local residents. The beginning of my research was focused on the fishing communities living in the coastal area, most affected by erosion and hurricane. These communities that for almost a century have been fighting and for their survival and their land and have gone through a lot of trauma due to this loss, but they continue to fight and move forward. As a foreigner and a new inhabitant in this region, I wanted to better understand the radical and disturbing change of their territory and at the same time my new territory. I was also very interested to learn more about their relation with smell in their profession and everyday life. Through their testimony, I quickly realized that it was very complex and that this project would last several years. This project, these different communities welcomed my research with enthusiasm and respect, but also with a lot of question. It was probably the first time someone asked them to think about their olfactive sense and also how we approach smell through language. Our terri territory of Encontroner was perhaps the uprooting. In this context, the smell extraction was going to help us and continue to do so to understand what we have lost, what connect us and make us resistance and resilience in a very personal way, but universal at the same time. In the show, you have an audio installation with a testimony collected by different fishing community in Delacroix and Plaquemine Parish. I'm showing here a map where you can see New Orleans the Lacroix uh, with the red dot and in the Plaquemine Parish starting at pont a and ending at Pas la Lutte State Wildlife. Here is a close-up of Plaquemine Parish where you see the hand of the region where the Mississippi River ends and is entering the Gulf of Mexico. The next image is a photo I took from the lighthouse located at Pla Pas la Lutte State Wildlife where the Mississippi River will flow into the Gulf of Mexico. These two, two images have been taken close to this area. Here it's an, it's an aerial view of the Lacroix Island. And here it's um, a typical house elevated on pier located in the Lacroix. I wanted to share with you just a few information about the Lacroix and Plaquemine Parish. Since the 20th century, the Lacroix has been regionally famous for fishing and trapping. Like much of the region, the Lacroix was devastated by Hurricane Katrina in 2005, 
the entire area was flooded and most buildings destroyed. By 2010, much of this fishing town had been reconstructed with most new construction and elevated high on pier. The region was once again devastated in the fall 2021 with Hurricane Ida. Plaquemine Parish is part of the New Orleans Menory Metropolitan Statistic Area. It was severely damaged in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina in 2005 and in Hurricane even in 2011, as well as in 2021 with Hurricane Ida. It is estimated that without a significant human intervention, Plaquemine Parish will lose 55% of its current land to rising sea level over the next 50 years. I wanted to share with you three different portions from different testimony. The first one is of Thomas Gonzalez, a fisherman in Delacroix that you can also hear in the show. I, it used to smell good before, but no more. Today you smell the fish and all of that, then the water, all the different water mixed together. Before you got to smell the river water, and then you got to the salty water from the Gulf. And when you used to fish in the Gulf with salty water, it was a totally different smell of water. Depending where you was fishing, you get different kind of smell. Fresh water, salty water, river water, backish water, the grass, the flowers. Today, our relationship to the smell of each waterway region has completely changed. The smells are less noticeable and certainly less differentiating. It's quite strange and disturbing. Here is a photo of Thomas Gonzalez. And the second one is another excerpt from Nikki Alfonso, a fisherman in Delacroix, not present in full in the show, but which seems to be important to share in this context. You will always have more memory of smell you don't want to remember, because the things you remember the most are the, the ones that you really don't want to remember. The perfect example for me is Hurricane Katrina, no smell like this. There was a pungent smell in the air that was always there. It never really went away. It was exacerbated by the heat and humidity for which the area is known. I guess it was from standing water and chemical I tried to tell myself that it didn't smell like this, but I'm sure it did. I can't forget that smell, even truth, I wish I could. I know I will smell it in the near future when I never want to smell it again. That's a photo of Nikki and me in his Fisher camp in Delacroix. <clears throat> and the last one is another portion not present in the show from Maria, a, reti a retired nurse in Meath Grove, Plaquemine Parish. The fisherman paradise is no longer here. The few people who live here, here year round, are worried. The smell that spreads, especially on days when the wind is blowing, is our direct in our direction, are bad and give me a headache. Look from the water; you can see on the left bank a big quantity of coal and a big factory. Environmental group representative pointed to the fact that because of the, the United States has been moving away from burning coal and pushing more toward natural gas, the coal instead often goes to countries such as China, Japan, India, Taiwan, Germany, and Turkey, country often with lower standards. And this still led up to carbon release to can affect climate change. Residents say that the fear possible health problem from the dust that can blow from coal pine ne nearby communities such as Irotam in Plaquemine Parish in Mead Grove, especially for those who suffer from asthma. National and local environmental group resident and some local elected official allege that the coal facility will bring pollution to neighboring communities and will harm coastal restoration effort. In these three fragments, we understood the importance that the smell play in front of trauma caused by the lust and the radical change of territory, and how climate change and the very bad political and environmental management of Louisiana, as well as petrochemical infrastructure, infrastructure excuse me, affect its inhabitants in their sensory and vital level. Here you see a photo from the location of the Gulf Coast Methanol Park that opened in recently 2017 and the photo of Warren, La Warren Lawrence collecting the water in this area. There is four, 
four olfactory work present in the exhibition, two smell of water and hers extracting in the marsh and in the bank of the Mississippi River. Their location have been chosen for their vulnerability and their fast disappearance. It becomes the olfactory memory of a place close to disappear or already disappeared. You can smell them in the two big boxes present in the exhibition. Here are a photo of me extracting some water close to Pass La Loutre State Wildlife in Pakeman Parish. And the second one is the sand extraction using a eight space, a technique developed in the late 80s to elucidate the odor component present in the air surrounding various objects. One of the early pioneers of the technology included the Swiss Roman Kaiser, who used it to measure and characterize the sand of the tropical rainforest. After the data is analyzed, the sand can then be re recreated, recreated by a perfumer in molecule. For a big part of my sand production, I work in close collaboration with Andreas William, a perfumer based in Zurich, Switzerland. One scent present is the show. Oh, let me go. One scent present is the show. It's called Golden Waste, and the other one, Land of Water. When you open these boxes, you will be immersed in your memories. For those who live in Louisiana, or more generally in the South, the smell of the bank of the river here, of the Mississippi, and the marsh is well known. But this smell of water and wet her smell in another cultural and geograph geographical context will have just as much power. They became an universal smell, and it refers us to our land, our territory, to our geography, and to our origins. In this manner, the origin of the smell is not so important, but what is important is what it generates. Very simply, it shows us how important these factors are for our identity and how powerful the smell can be and can bring us back to memories. The two other scents present in the show are the honey and the magnolia. This can be smelled under two different cloches. These two smells have been extracted in Louisiana. The magnolia flower was extracted in New Orleans. It is a symbol of the state of Louisiana and the smell of spring. It smells strong and its flower and petals are spread in the street and park. Today, the magnolia tree is present all over the world in Europe, where it's acclimatized, as well as in Asia and in the Middle East. Each region and climate gives this flower a different scent, but it remains a very common smell in the world. To complement the smell, I choose to show the print of John James Oderman, Black Gillette Cuckoos from 1828. Here, the two cuckoos are on the magnolia tree. One seems to have landed on one of the branches to catch an insect. On this picture, the three stages of flowering are represented, the flower bud, bud the flower, and the faded flowers. The second smell in, this, in the show is the smell of honey. It was extracted in Delacroix Parish at John and Thomas Gonzalez Garden in their beehive. Here it's a photo of me and John and Thomas in their kitchen. Here it's a photo of Thomas extracting the honey. Here it's a photo of the bees and the beehive. And here it's a photo of the headspace extraction, the smell of the honey. I wanted to share with you a portion of the testimony of John Gonzalez and her husband Thomas that you can also uh, hear in the show. You can't keep a garden here, too much water. We lost a lot of our land and all of our backyard. Everything changed over there here. Everything looks so different as when I, was, I grew up. When I was a young boy in the 40s, we had plenty of land all over. We used to watch it from far away. And you had beautiful weather for four or five days. We don't get that no more. Everything's changed over there here. It's totally different. We could walk for miles on our land, but no, we can't. We are living by boat today. I wish the politician will pump our land back. They try to build land with water, but water didn't build land. Like John say, we don't have a garden anymore, but we have bees. We do our honey, our house smell like honey. The taste of it and the smell change a lot after the year. We have less and less white flower here, all gone, no bird. 
we don't even have Sparrow anymore. We lost them all during Katrina. They never came back. They were so nice. They used to come and eat the small insect and our crab, crab trap. Today they are only the raven and sometimes some cardinal. We don't have the flowers all disappear. It's like a dead world here. But we still do honey and it's still tasty with just another taste as in the past. In their case, their honey production become a symbol of resistance to nature which is dying and for which the bee are proof of its strength and survival. Most of fishermen I visit um, do have bees and are producing honey for their communities, even if most of these communities have lost a big part of their land due to erosion and hurricane, their land is as much important as their boat. They fight to preserve it, and the powerful taste of their honey is for me the symbol of their battle. In the show, I choose the print of Trump's and other van girl and a parrot. I wanted to share with you some information about this bird given to me by Geoffrey Hale, professor and curator of bird here at Auburn University. The last Carolina parakeet died in captivity in 1980. 18, sorry. The extinction of the, la the once plentiful species officially declared in 1931 it's true to have been caused by a variety of factors, including habitat destruction and the plume bloom. A 19th century trend involving the use of feather in fashion. It is also speculated that the bird, the only parrot species native to the eastern United States, were adversely affected by competition for nesting sites with honeybees. The non native bees are thought to have con constructed hives in their tree cavities where the parakeet will roots and nest. Here is an opposite example. The resistance of non-native bee will lead to the extinction of this native and magnificent bird. In the show, I also choose to present a bird specimen from the Museum of Natural History at, of the Great Shearwater. Here is a photo of the specimen in the show. And here it's a watercolor paint made by John James Audubon representing the bird. I wanted to share with you some information about this bird given to me by Geoff Geoffrey Hill, professor and curator of bird here in Audubon Universities. Shearwater are seabirds that have adapted a signature evo evolutionary trait. Unlike many other bird species that depend primarily on sight or sound to navigate their habitat, Shearwater are part of the avian family that depend of, on attraction to survive. Their, their, their sense of smell, facilitated by a unique tube-shaped nose, aids in the reconciliation of food and, and in oceanic navigation. John, John James Audubon is often credited with perpetuating the misassumption that birds cannot smell. Based on this constructed observation of the scavenging habitat of Turkey vulture, his 19th century depiction of the shear water, however, accurately represents the family distincting color. The title I choose for the exhibition is A Swallow Does Not Make a Summer. This proverb, this proverb refers to the swallow and its migration, announcing that it's arrival, the spring or the summer, according to where the bird is located in the world. Idiom saying to mean that one good thing doesn't necessarily mean that the general situation is better. The title put in perspective the doubt, the unknown, and a certain non-control of the man in front of the nature and its becoming, but also, of course, its responsibility towards it. I would like to rely on another image chosen by in the collection with it. Sweet with Yana Audubon in the Atchafalaya in 1994 for Rainton Collette Scott. This image by its, its graphic beauty, but of course also by what it demonstrates is magnificent and terrifying. In the left, you can see some snowy aigrette and two women wearing a hat decorated with their feather. The battle over the commercial trade in the bird feather in the late 19th and 20th century was one of the first time we saw a popular movement merging in defense of the environment and not surprisingly to us to save bird. More than five million birds were being massacred really to safety to the blooming North American mineral trade. 
On the right side of the picture, you can see a representation of other band watching the bird and painting them. Also, you can see two people enjoying and nourishing their crawfish. In the center of the picture, you see the, anchor, the hunter killing the snowing angret. You can also see some ivory billed bill woodpecker, which are also considering to be on the verge of extinction. All this in a typical Louisiana landscape, which also seems already have been massacred and polluted. With this famous work realized in the late 90s, Warrington Collect Scott was already giving us a look and a warming, warning and a pause to reflect on how much man has already extracted and destroyed his environment, and more specifically here in the southern region of the United States. In March 22, I read in The Guardian an article with the title A Barbaric Federal Programs US Kill 1.7 Million Animal Last Year. This is an equivalent of 200 <coughs> killing per hour. Among these animals killed are alligator, armadillos, doe, holes, otter, porcupine, snake, and turtles. A reparent stalling paid a higher price, accounting for more than one millionth of the animal killed. But there are also 324 gray wolves, 65 coyotes, 440 black bear, 200 mountain lions, 605 lynx, 3,000 foxes, 25,000 beaver, a very time Noah, Noah Ark of Spicy, the British newspaper summarized. The Wildlife Services is targeting certain invasive species that is considered of threat to ecosystems such as ferret pig and atria. But it is also controversially killing a large number of species native to the United States. The article explained this number have drawn the higher to of conversation group who have denounced the cruelty and the futility of these calls. Wildlife services, on the other hand, say the deaths are necessary to protect farmer and public health, farm production and industry. Reading this article shortly after visiting the collection and seeing the work of Warrington Collection and John James Audubon, I could only see a correspondence and a consistent concern. In the exhibition, you will also find a series of eight cyanotypes and five specimens of the Museum of, of Natural Science. These specimens are a selection of non-native Louisiana plants that have re-emerged and for some part are having a harmful effect in their new environment. Here pictured is a water reason and a Chinese tallow tree. <clears throat> In contrast of this specimen, the cyanotype have been realized with plants native to Louisiana, such as elephant here, banana leaf, and palmetto. Most of these prints are not really sharp and almost ghostly. To make them, I put the photosensitive paper on a board and I placed it under the plant. So I never cut the plant. This is the opposite of what is known in the history of cyanotype, where usually the specimen is cut in order to be documented in a precise way. It, either, it is also a wink and a criticism to Judson Audubon, who also for most of part killed the specimen to paint them. Here the blue colors and the technique also suggest to us something aquatic, suggesting also the submerged land where hearths become water and water become hearths. And in this context, these plants sometimes become ghosts of their native landscape. One of the, of the print is different from the other. It's shown a plant and its roots. There is not much to recognize the plant, so we don't know its origin and where it has been extracted. It comes to question the complete theory and asking ourselves if it's an harmful substance for its environment or if it is a native and if one is more damaging than the other. The blue again give us a depth where it's the, these roots seem to fly or float. It questions the origin. One does not know if it's going to be rooting out or if it's going to be planted. It is again a metaphor of our responsibility in the face of this perishing age. So, <clears throat> excuse me. The work presented in this exhibition has the desire to give matter to reflect in a personal and sensitive way and asking this question. What do you want to do with this world of which we became both the grave digger and the guardian? 
Will we be the guardian of the earth or the powerful aspect of our omnipotence? And I would like to finish this presentation with this beautiful phrase from the French philosopher and sociologist Edgar Morin. The probable is the disintegration. The improbable but possible is the meta metamorphosis. Thank you. I'm so excited to put our thoughts in conversation now. And um, I often start these kinds of talks with thinkers and creators by asking a question about origin story. How do you come to specifically consider smell in your work? And olfaction. <clears throat> Yeah, I think in that in that in that sense it's really personal. Mm -hmm. Like I would kind of explain in the in the presentation, um, the fact that I moved from a certain territory to a new territory and um, coming from the north part of Europa, where I grew up, uh, close to the mountain, cold hair, crispy hair, uh, where my sense of olfaction was totally different uh, as coming traveling and coming to live here in Louisiana with 100 percent of communities and well the smell are so vividly mm -hmm. um, in the air um, and I think it became it started just with a physical experience of biking through the city and going from so many different kind of terrible smell to fantastic smell and vividly <laughs> physically being emerged on that and and directly telling myself that's so and crazy, I want to do something with smell, but that was the first month for after I moved to New Orleans, and it's taken me two years um, to probably arrive, and it's been slowly uh, analyzing where I'm living and starting finding myself. I want to understand better where I am, what's happening, and the olfaction came uh, for me uh, at all, uh, reasons to start the project uh, and to connect with the community. Thanks for the question. Um, so for me, I was working on a project about literary naturalism and um, the ways in which naturalist writers, um, so naturalists would include people like Jack London, Stephen Crane, Upton Sinclair, um, how they were representing human relations with the environment, right? And it just struck me that this was a genre within like you know, 19th century work is like generally fairly de deodorized. There are like huge exceptions to that, but there just aren't like a whole lot of smells um, that figure really prominently in 19th century work by and large. But naturalism was just like really consistently stinky and like just filled with not only smells, but smells that had agency, right? Like they were like constraining people, transforming, debilitating people. And it's largely because naturalism is interested in representing humans as animals, right? Like products of their heredity and environment. Um, but this just like made me really like dig into the idea of smell as a transcorporeal sense. And then in the meantime, I came across some critical writing like in the popular press about olfactory art, which, you know, was being represented as this new weird thing in pretty sensationalistic terms. And it seemed clear to me that the, at least the critics I was looking at, and you know, these were kind of like bloggers, right? There are, you know, I later learned they're like really like sophisticated folks writing about smell, but at, at the time it just seemed to me that like it was pretty under theorized. So folks weren't really thinking like framing olfactory art in a way that made sense of why people were doing olfactory art. Um, and the work that I'd been doing on transcorporeality and environmental risk seemed to me like a really helpful way to think about like some of the key contributions that olfactory art might be able to make. Yeah, it seems so interesting that the kind of through line is in some ways around language or its absence or about translation, which I think is interesting. Um, and I wanted to turn to you first, Manon, um, 
for how for, you've talked about the kind of trend, the movement through space, and it's the kind of defamiliarization of moving in a new space impacted this project. I'm wondering how um, language also factored in, especially since you're interviewing subjects as part of your process. Yeah, no, <clears throat> it, absolutely. So I think um, when I started the project, you know, um, and especially working with the communities where not everyone was, you know, I still have a kind of a strong accent and uh, not everyone was able always to understand properly, but this was not even the matter. Um, mm. I think that was to find a communication through the, the old faction became just uh, a medium, um, but that was like I was speaking this morning or later this afternoon, narration has so much to do uh, with the project as well. Um, so the final result is the sand, but all what was exchanged verbally around it is as much important as the final result. And I think uh, perhaps through um, navigating on boats, uh, sometimes we have been on boat for many hours, not even speaking, absence of language but the understanding of the landscape it's also an answer and you don't always have to put word mm -hmm. and I think the idea of the scent is also really to, to bring you physically in something from an experience that you and I was also speaking earlier about to be a bit irritated mm -hmm. uh, this irritation of not totally understanding what it is and uh, that force you to formulate something <laughs> and it's also what I wish to create in the show it's incredibly visceral. Um, and I, I want to kind of give a version of that question to you, Sean, uh, in terms of how the dialogic is playing in, however you want to run with that in your work. Are you, do you consider yourself engaged in a kind of, uh, with interlocutors? Are you, um, you know, are you, uh, how, how is that, how is that functioning? That's a great question. And I mean, you know, I was trained as a literary scholar and I often write about literature, but one of the things that has been really pleasant for me and like just transformative for some of like the work that I'm doing is like actually meeting olfactory artists. So I travel, I got a, like some funding to travel to Europe and interview some of the like olfactory artists there and olfactory art, like I think got a much earlier start in Europe. Um, then it started circulating like in, you know, certain kinds of spaces in the U.S. That's changing now with folks like the Anik Yi show, you know, at the Guggen Guggenheim. But um, yeah, so I got, to, I got to talk to some artists and, you know, like talk through like their experiences of certain smells, like the process by which they made certain smells, which is just like so fascinating. Right, the headspace technology and the reasons for choosing certain scents rather than others. Um, and I think it's just really, really important because smell is so personal, right? So when artists or just regular folks you're talking to are talking about smells, they often go into these kind of like litanies of smells, right? Like in some of the quotes that you met, that you showed um, or into accounts of really personal smells like that quote that I showed about the smell of kimchi um, so these kinds of like interviews um, are not a kind of work that I was accustomed to doing or trained to do, but I think it's, it's you know, I also was, was trained in 19th century literature, so I didn't get to actually interview the writers I was working on, and it's been really fun. Yeah, so how is it working with the living? I mean, solidarity as, some, as an 18th centuryist who is also suddenly working with the living, it's, uh, it can be quite challenging. <laughs> um, one of the things that we haven't really talked about, aside from um, the the industrial as it imposes itself on the landscape, is just commercial scent production and how it's involved. And I wonder if uh, you guys want to reflect on that element of of thinking about this. It's it's at once something you're describing, but it's also um, industrial scent production allows for headspace technology and, and, and these sorts of things. So it's kind of two sides of the coin. I wonder how you think about the industrial, the scent industry as you relate to it, or whether you just relate to it not at all. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, a lot of my work and the work of folks that I work on um, 
addresses like commercial scent production pretty critically, right? So the Beatrice Glow uh, piece on the colonial history of, you know, fragrance products. There's this amazing spoken word poem that I would have played if I had more time by William Utuku uh, Giles, um, who is Samoan. Um, I, I, I hope I, I'm getting this right. Um, and um, it's called Deodorant. You can find it online. It's fantastic. Uh, but I, I mean, I do think that olfactory art is, it's in a, a kind of like interesting relationship, right, with the industry. So a lot of events, um, a lot of artists are funded by International Flavors and Fragrances. Um, a lot of events, the in Institute of Art and Olfaction, I don't know if it's that particular, you know, if it's IFS, but, you know, they have like some funding that's coming from the industry, right? And that's... You know, I think it, it's just like, it's an interesting position. I think one that needs to be acknowledged. Um, but I do think that to the extent that this funding is making both like critical work available and also work that's like more experimental, right? Like the the piece that I was talking about by Tana East, that's like where they're really looking or creating sense for individuals, right? Um, to kind of have a reparative effect on these individuals and not really like scents that are going to be marketed as perfumes that people are going to wear. Um, I think that that's, that's cool. Yeah, this is where I do the pop-up explainer and say there are only five major kind of industrial uh, flavor and fragrance companies in the world. And basically everybody's connected to them in some way, shape or form. Um, and the number is that used to the number used to be a slightly larger. It used to be seven. Um, so there's been kind of steady consolidation, as with many other places in our our world. Um, have I given you enough time to think about industry? Yeah, and I don't think it's as direct, but I have few things coming in my mind in different level. Uh, first of all, the perfumer I'm working with based in Zurich. Um, so working with a perfumer because I never did that before. <laughs> I also understood that better about the industrial perfumes because he worked uh, for the last 20 years, he worked in the perfume industry. Uh, it's also, as an artist, uh, you, you said, you know, that some sponsoring or like money from big uh, company, like it's also extremely difficult as a visual artist to find a perfumer that wish and can even work with you because most of the time perfumers that work in the industry, they don't have the right to produce something else as in the mm. industry they are in. Uh, so I was really lucky to be connected with this perfumer, but also he stopped to, totally stopped to work with the industry because he was discussed by it and also for different reasons. And now he started to produce his perfume, where his perfume sucks. <laughs> That's the name of the <laughs> And all the components in the perfume are on the bottle, meaning like nothing is, you know, it's like why to make it secrets is almost all these companies they use the same substances and mm -hmm. they are not that creative anyway. Most of the money goes for the the, the production or the publicity, but not really from the scent. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not directly answering your question, but it's, it's a personal there, yeah. it's a personal uh, experience that I had to that. But also re relating back to the communities I visited, you know, like this fisherman one told me um, that. For, um, for a fisherman, it's it's an old kilt, but for a fisherman or anyone that fish or, or, or shrimp or when you come back home and you smell bad, that's a symbol of money. It means mm. you, you work hard and that's actually good to smell bad. And um, and 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 so, you know, in that sense, uh, it's also reversing, you know, they order and they don't need that. I mean, in all this boat I went it was never any additional good smell. <laughs> but most of the people I visit in their house, they have this super synthetic candle. Mm. And I remember like telling me, oh, we have put, oh, sorry, it don't smell so good here. And I just me, it was smelling perfectly nice honey. Let me put my candle and then, you know, it's strawberry. Or like, and then it's, you know, it's, it's also interesting. It's so personal, the relation you have with... So, what smell good, what don't, what don't. It's also really cultural. Um, and sometimes we could be wrong with our thinking. Yeah, so, yeah, so. Those, those, those intentions uh, versus the kind of uh, the smellscape uh, of, of good intentions can go awry so, so quickly and easily. Um, I'm wondering if you guys have questions for each other that you'd like to.
feel like I've asked you a lot of questions already, <laughs> but I could ask you one again. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you mentioned to me earlier that this was a continuing project, so it's unfinished. Um, could you talk about, uh, you know, next steps in the pro project or other aspects of the work that you're planning to explore? Yeah, no, like I was explaining to Sean earlier, you know, um, when you, when the static product project was extremely uh, based on New Orleans and the region for the region or for the reason I already explained, so I'm not going to repeat myself why I, why I'm, I've developed this project in these regions. Uh, but I think like everything you developed, not, that's one example of my research. But I think it's concerned everyone that is in the creative field or in professional field. Sometimes you really need to get out of the center and to be on the periphery, to understand better what is going on in the center. Um, and I think it's more my goal now. It's also I've been being in Switzerland for two months, doing this olfactory research in a totally different kind of landscape and trying to correlate these two ter opposite territories. Um, I want to rethink my approach on communities in New Orleans. Also, we spoke earlier with the complexity of communities. Mm. <clears throat> because I just have visited a really small community that is absolutely not representative of what Louisiana and New Orleans is. Um, so I think my goal is to start better, um, like perhaps a different approach of what, what our faction is and territories and communities, perhaps with the Huma communities and also the Vietnamese fisher communities that is extremely big in Louisiana. Um, and try to involve in not only a faction, but perhaps more sound, more immersive work, less and less image, mm. and more and more some physical experience. Um, yeah, the haptic seems like the next territory, the space of more tactility mm -hmm. and touch. It's, it's, it's already there, but not as much as the visual. Exciting to think about. And are you still thinking olfactorily, or is this launching you um, as in your thinking to other territories, so to speak? Um, so I, I am still thinking about olfactory art and writing, um, but it, at a slower pace. Um, my current work is um, just a, a shorter book that's more public facing on air conditioning and culture. Um, so there is, I mean, so some things that I've been learning about in that book. I mean, it's partly like part of it is about like the history of how we came to live in and just kind of ex work like travel through in our day to day lives, like a series of air conditioned bubbles. Right. So that we live in these sort of apparently sealed off bubbles. But the cover of the book is the, um, the ex exterior part of an air conditioning unit. Right. And it's like in a red tint, like sorry, a red um, tinge. Um, a color that I chose um, because I wanted it to look warm, right? And to kind of remind us that air conditioners actually emit heat outside. Um, so some things that I've been thinking about with that book, um, like just the way that air conditioning has influenced like building design, right? So we're in a museum and museums, um, the scholar Fernando Dominguez Rubio describes them as giant refrigerators for art, right? Because they're designed to keep art stable so that it doesn't deteriorate um, by keeping our cool 24 seven, right? So when we leave, it's gonna be this temperature in the other spaces of the museum, at least like forever, basically. Um, so that's, that's of interest to me, like the air conditioning of like data and cultural objects and archives. And then also I've been thinking about like temperature as a medium of racism, right? So the way that like temperature differentials, especially in the urban heat island, Right, which is mapped onto like redlined um, neighborhoods in American cities um, that, you know, those kind of impose all kinds of health effects and just like daily living experiences um, in ways that are racially disproportionate and, you know, really harm poor and people of color communities. Um. I do, we have Chris with the mic. If anyone in the audience has a question that they would like to share. Ooh, got hands. All right, so I actually have three questions. Um, so the first one is, have either of you done studies on the 
the relationship between different cultural smells and architecture in world history, if there is such a relationship. Can you um, expand the thought just a little bit? Do you have a specific example that you're thinking of, of that? Well, so what comes to mind, and this is outside my area of expertise, what comes to mind is various different, I guess, smells associated with cultural foods and cuisines. Mm. And so I was wondering if there was any sort of correlation between different types of architecture and, I guess, the smells that would be prevalent in a certain region, either in the past or in the present. I, I haven't thought about that directly. I mean, I could say a little bit about it um, based on like the, the like book about air conditioning, right? Which is that the spread of air conditioning, climate control technologies, um, really, you know, contributed hugely to the production of quote deodorized spaces, right? So spaces from which most kind of culturally less desirable odors or less valorized odors have been removed. And then, of course, that creates an empty canvas for us to then sort of repopulate what smells that people think of as desirable, classy, sexy, whatever, right? So, I mean, in a way, like, that's the kind of architectural key, right, to these, you know, empty canvas spaces that we inhabit where um, the commodified fragrance stuff that we've been talking about becomes kind of, you know, infinitely possible. And I've written a little bit about how tobacco smoke can be used, has been used in the 18th century British context as a demarcation of masculinized spaces like smoking clubs and, and things like that. And then might be a little bit of a reach for you, but spas and the smell of sulfur and its association with health in those um, kind of built environments, again, there, there are, there are, uh, the sensory studies site will have a big list of folks who are working on this because I'm, I'm guessing there's probably somebody who is thinking about this more specifically than we are. But you had two more questions. Yes, I do. I always like to pepper the pres presenter with questions <laughs> whenever I go to one of these. Bless so you. the other two are quicker. And the first one is you showed a slide a while back about uh, various books involving smell. Where can we access that, that list of books? Uh, it is directly drawn from sensorystudies.org, which has a books of note that goes in chronological order. Uh, it does include all the senses, um, but I pulled out the ones that had scent or smell in the title. Okay. Um, you said the sensory... Sensorystudies.org. Okay, thank you. And lastly, um, Dr. Swong, is that correct? Um, Doctor Sean. Uh, Sean. Uh, where can one access your books on not only air conditioning, but also smell and racial uh, oppression? Um, the air conditioning book you can access in the future, <laughs> <laughs> because I'm still writing it. But okay. um, the books, I mean, the book, The Smell of Risk, it should be at the university library um, or, you know, available online. Um, and parts of it and other things I've I've published on smell are, you know, published in article and essay form online. Some of it open access. I believe the jewel has a link on the event page to the to the website for your book. All right, thank you. We have a hand over there. Hi, thank you all for this presentation. It was very insightful. I learned a lot. Um, I actually specifically have questions for Dr. Sue. Um, I really enjoy what you were talking about as far as, I've never ever thought racial racism smell, but when you think about it, it makes sense because I've seen people actually make fun of somebody who's like, for example, East Indian, for smell like curry, but then they enjoy Indian food, and so it's like with the person, it's some type of discrimination. I never thought of it before, but I can see that. So um, my question I have too, um, about the microclimates for BIPOC people, and what that entails. And I, I'm kind of telling that because I just saw um, Black Panther Wakanda forever. And there's a scene where uh, Namor comes to Wakanda and he says, the air is different here. And I wonder, is there a, a correlation between colonization and smell? Because is the air cleaner in places where there hasn't been any colonization or is it different? Is it a better smell than what we experience when we're, I hate to say it like it's under oppression. Yeah. And my 
second um, request really is if you could show the slides that you skipped and kind of go over those because they look interesting. I just want to see more about that. <laughs> I'd be happy to. Um, so let me first uh, address your first question. Um, and that's awesome. I want to watch Wakanda forever. I have a five-year-old, so I don't get to the movies much. Um, but but yeah, I'm trying to remember the question part of that. Um, the microclimates, microclimates. Microclimates, right. So is, yeah, it, I was is colonizing kinda, um, uh, toxic? Right, is colonizing toxic? Yes, colonizing is toxic. <laughs> uh, microclimates is a concept I'm taking from a, a, an interview with Christina Sharp in The Funambulist, which is this great um, kind of uh, arts magazine. Um, but also uh, references her work in The Wake, right, where she talks about the weather of anti-Blackness. So the way that anti-Blackness is atmospheric and pervasive, and it's kind of everywhere, both like in the cultural atmosphere we inhabit, right? Um, and also, I'm, I'm not doing the work justice, right? But, but also materially, right? So the, the actual weather is part of what, what I'm emphasizing there, you know, when, when I talk about smell and heat. So she talks about, like within the context of a totalizing racist weather, she talks about the importance then of creating microclimates that sustain black life, right? Um, and that's, that's kind of what I was riffing on there, you know, in part with reference to Tanais's work with formerly incarcerated women, right? So how can you kind of create work that might help to sustain them as well as work? Because I just at some point felt like I'd been sitting for a long time with work that's about exposing toxicity, right? Which is really important. Um, but then also artists are doing other really important things to kind of think about, well, how do you rebuild from or kind of like sustain life and thriving within these climates? Um, so let me go to the slides. Are folks okay with me like doing that? I don't wanna, if do anyone it, do it. to be talking about a couple slides, um, please speak now. Okay, so, okay, so I point. partly I was thinking about um, conjure or hoodoo as another form of everyday olfactory aesthetics, right? So it often got, oh, sorry. Um, it often got, got framed by kind of like experts and by folks who did not believe in it, right? Um, bourgeois folks. Etc. as like unscientific, superstitious, et cetera. But it really flourished um, with the Great Migration as people moved to cities in the north and would, you know, mail order conjure materials, many of which were scented, right? So um, southern roots, vetiver, um, oils, candles, powder sachets. I found the part of my notes incense, fumigants, et cetera. There's even a practice of dusting the courtroom where you could kind of like disperse a dust in a courtroom so that your like legal decision might go well. But I argue that, you know, these actually do contribute to health potentially at least insofar as they kind of give people some degree of agency over their atmosphere, right? Especially kind of in creating atmospheric connections between you know, the urban kind of air that they're, you know, living in and more familiar spaces from the South. Um, so these kind of connections with memory and across space, sometimes circum-Caribbean or circum-Atlantic as well as circum-Caribbean connections um, that I think are really um, powerful. So um, just connected with that, um, I would have talked. <laughs> And I'm now talking a bit about the work of the Washington DC based artist, Renee Stout, who explores these connections um, between material atmospheres, spirituality and health. Her artworks are inspired by hoodoo or conjure. Um, these images are from Tales of the Conjure Woman where she takes on the kind of persona of Fatima Mayfield who is a purveyor of herbs and potions and a kind of community healer um, and so there are like scented elements to this exhibition and on the chalkboard is a list of um, things I'll need for the seduction of Sterling Rochambeau, right? So like just a person and it lists different scented materials as well as like commercial perfumes um, that she would have 
potentially included in this seduction attempt, right? So it's, I, I see it in part as about a kind of um, empowerment of black women's sexuality and agency within a context of like the larger meta narrative of, of the ex exhibition involves like a local like religious authority who's really telling people to like avoid the conjure woman at all costs, right? So kind of like religious patriarchy as the um, alternative or the antithesis. Thanks. Thank you. Um, real quick, um, one more thing. How do we have any way to access any of the information from your slides? Do we have any way to uh, to access the information from your slides? Like yeah. the okay. Yeah. And I think we're just at eight, Chris. I think that's Dang true. Dang on time. Thank thank all three of you. You're amazing. Thank you for being here tonight. And I just want to mention on your way out, we have little scent cards for you to pick up with samples of Manon's scents that we're handing out on the way out tonight. Thank you all for being here.